Okay, so welcome everybody. And we are finally at a spot where we can think about um, what happened there. Think about parallel programming. And um, that in itself, of course, sounds really nice and interesting, um, but we do it for a reason. Obviously, we do this because our computations are too slow if we run on a single core. And so that's why a lot of the, the cores, we actually talked about the single core performance, really, if you think about it. Like, uh, we might have compiled a, a, a code and then run on one code, or we might have linked to a library. And some libraries can do parallelism, but not all of them. So for the most part, uh, we've been like optimizing code for a single core. and then. Uh, last week, Marcelo showed how you could use several of those serial codes at the same time and still get a lot of work done with all the cores that are on a typical compute nodes, right? So um, today we're actually going to look at the case where rather than being able to do a lot of serial codes at the same time uh, to a point where we, we we can't do that anymore. Our, our single serial code, we're going to assume, is too slow to, uh, to uh, either finish or the size of the system is too large to be computed uh, by a single core and there's not enough memory. One of those cases is what we're going to start looking at now. Um, this week, we're going to look particularly at uh, what's called shared memory programming, uh, shared memory, memory parallel programming. And so uh, that, we do that with a technique called OpenMP. And that's that's what it's going to be about, and uh, so um, that's that's our our main objective this this week. So just to uh, reiterate uh, what Marcel already mentioned last week, um, when we look at even uh, the the login node of the Teach cluster, if you, if you log in there, um, it has more than one core. In fact, your uh, your cell phone has more than one core, and or more than likely your laptop if it's if it's not 20 years old, has more than one core. And so, but the way that this works is that there's still one big pool of memory. So your computer has a bunch of memories, a certain number of gigabytes, and then there are cores there. Um, I think for the Teach cluster, there's something like 32 gigabytes of, of RAM, and there is uh, 16 cores, something like that. Maybe it's 64 gigabytes of RAM. Um, they can all, all those cores can do something independently. So if you think of them as little calculators, they can all be calculating something differently at the same time, uh, but they see the same memory, so the same data. Uh, that is a very convenient way to, to view the system because if, if you have some data to process, say, and but you now each data element takes a bit of time, you just divide the work over your cores, they can all see that same data. There's no need to copy data from uh, from where it is to, to a core, anything like that. Okay. The, uh, so the way that this, this, this is uh, envisioned or how, how this is called is that you have, so if one shared memory uh, block, uh, each of the cores do something differently. The thing that they do is called a thread of execution. So while core two might be adding some numbers, core one might be uh, either multiplying some numbers or adding different numbers, those are different threads of execution um, that they do. It's like they're, they're running different programs. Okay. Now, um, be, as I always said, because it's shared memory, you don't have to pass any messages around to get data from one core to the other. But what it does mean is that this only works if the system has shared memory. And the memory on, uh, on a supercomputer or on a cluster is typically only shared within a single node. So the Teach cluster has several nodes. Um, each node 64 gigabytes. So those 16 cores can look at the 64 gigabytes all, all fine. But as soon as you try to run things on, say, two nodes, you would think now you have 32 uh, processes, 32 cores at your disposal. And so you have 128 gigabytes. So maybe you have a bit a big problem and it's 128 gigs. It, that's what it needs. You can't run that with a shared memory parallel programming because the cores on one node can't see the memory of the core of the other node. So now you have to do MPI, message patching interface. So next week, we'll look at how that is done. Um, so, so from the on onset, it's clear that shared memory programming is limited to a single node. 
And, and even though those single nodes these days have lots of cores, Niagara has, for instance, 40 cores, uh, that's a, a, a lot of cores and a good bit of memory, there is a limitation to how far you can scale uh, your, your system or your computation or the number of cores uh, with OpenMP. So that should be set from the onset. So OpenMP then is, is a standard. It's a, a way to write uh, what they say uh, or how, how they formulate it. It's unknown, unknown, performant, uh, portable parallel code. The unknown here is the same as saying shared memory for us, for our purposes, but there are also ways to use OpenMP to, for instance, uh, perform computations on a graphics card that is in that same node. So offloading to an accelerator is something that uh, newer versions of the OpenMP specification can support. So it's on node, it will, it's not meant to be uh, 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 scaling beyond that. Nodes get bigger and bigger, so OpenMP is actually, uh, in a sense, becoming more and more powerful because of uh, the sheer number of cores in a single node these days. So multi-core shared memory systems are what we are going to focus on, because that's, the, that's what we have in the Teach cluster, that's what Niagara is as well. Um, another thing that's really nice about OpenMP is that you can take a serial code and sort of incrementally add parallelism. So you can say, hey, here's a bit of the code that um, could be done in parallel. Maybe it is doing the same kind of computation on a set of, of, of data in, a, in an array, and each element of the array could be done separately by a different core. That's how you, that's, that's the way you would detect things in OpenMP. Um, and there's a, a nice website. This one's a little old, um, uh, but uh, an old snapshot that they update the, the site uh, quite frequently. They come up with new uh, standards or new uh, specifications, they call them. Uh, they just came out with 5.1. Um, like with the compiler versions, what that mean is, means is that, yes, that's now a specification, but not all compilers support it yet. So um, most compilers are stuck somewhere between 4.5 and, and, and 5. Um, not stuck there at that point. Um, so the compiler has to support this. This is not a. This is not just a library. This is a language extension, and so the compiler has to support it. A lot of compilers do. Uh, GCC compiler, uh, Intel compiler, IBM compilers. Um, uh, lots of them uh, uh, support this, uh, but that means that the compiler has quite a bit of things to do, which is convenient. It means a lot of the parallel programming that you would have to do by hand. Uh, we don't have to do. So uh, we are not going to look at the native C++ uh, shared memory parallel programming constructs. There are, there's a thread library in C++ that you could use to do the things that you can do with OpenMP, but it is way more low level. And so I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to touch that here. Uh, OpenMP is, is a way to do it very, very uh, much more direct in a sense, like much more, more you can make your intentions much more clear in less code uh, than, than with the, the C++ thread library. Also nice is that uh, OpenMP works in, in C, C++, and Fortran, um, uh, and pretty much in, in, the, in the same way with slight syntax differences. Um, so all of the, compiled, the common compiled languages in scientific computing um, are supported. Does not work for, for Python for many reasons. Does not work in R, but you could have libraries that you call, say, from R, and R is very common, and even from uh, from Python if you use like NumPy. And then under the hood, uh, those libraries like NumPy, for instance, might be uh, using OpenMP to to accelerate things and run things on multiple ports. But you yourself can't use OpenMP in Python code or R code or or Bash or uh, yeah, Java or any of those. Okay, so how does it work, OpenMP? Um, there's three aspects of using this specification. First, you have to change your code. You add lines, and those lines are all gonna start with a pound sign and then pragma and then OMP. That's how it works in C++ in any case. Um, for compilers that don't understand OMP, they will probably give a warning that they don't know what to do with it, but they will still compile your code. Um, and if the compiler does know what to do with it, great. That's how it starts uh, an OpenMP uh, fragma or an OpenMP directive, as they are called. Um, so uh, this, and, uh, and it takes the next code block. Uh, so um, it doesn't paralyze it. That's not right. It, it, it does something 
uh, whatever this the, the remainder is that falls here um, is applied to the next code block. Um, then that's not good enough because the compilers actually can switch off or on this OpenMP support. So for G++, you have to add the flag dash F OpenMP for these pragmas to be actually effective to do anything. Otherwise, you still have a serial code. Um, so this is how you switch them on. And then finally, when you run, um, you could say, you could specify how many cores you actually want to use. Uh, you might have this 16 core machine, but it might be doing something else in the meantime, and you only want to use, say, four cores, or you are on the, uh, the teach login node, and there's like a number of users, and you are nice, and you're not going to take all of the cores uh, and, and leave nothing for the other users, so you, you can restrict it. And you can do that by setting an uh, environment variable, and it's omp underscore num underscore threads. So just as an example, uh, and these examples are on the... Uh, on the uh, uh, file system so you could clone them <clears throat> excuse me if you want um so that there's a little program called omp hello world in this directory um and it's uh if i just make it do we need to know the number of sorry the, the chat and myself are overlapping uh the number of cores while writing the code <clears throat> uh no uh, you, uh, um but that that should be in pur uh, on purpose. You should write your code such that it doesn't matter how many threads are used or how many cores are used. So within this uh, context, uh, the cores that you use are, are just called threads. It's really how many threads of execution. That's why it's number threads. Okay. <clears throat> so um, if, you, if you just look at this code, sorry. So here's the code that I'm trying to compile with that uh, statement there. Um, and it, it looks like a regular code that does an uh, a write out to uh, to console at start of program and then writes hello world from thread and then does something funny here with, uh, with things. Um, <clears throat> and here's a pragma OMP. I'm just gonna see what it does. So I'm now compiling with, uh, with G++ specifically, but for this cloned repo, you could also do make OMP hello world. Um, so G++, SCD C++14, because that's what we're using. Uh, we'll do some optimization, uh, dash O2, and then uh, we're going to write to a executable, so dash uh, lowercase o, OMP hello world, that's going to be our executable, executable and our, uh, our code is an OMP dash hello dash world.cc. Um, and then here's the flag that enables the OpenMP. If I don't add this flag, um, it's going to ignore those, and it's going to just pretend like it's not even there. And if it's not even there, um, it, it would print... Uh, um, just one, it would not be parallel. Um, now, the first thing I'm going to do is set the number of threads to one, just to see what happens if I'm not using multiple cores, but I'm running this core, this code anyway. So I'm exporting OMP num threads one. Uh, and mind you, the export here is really necessary um, when you have uh, subshells. Um, in this case, and and, and this is a sub, or sub processes. So um, in bash variables are they can have values so i'm setting the value here if i don't export them those variables are not available uh, for other programs i call from in the shell so that's why the export is here. so I export omp num threads equals one and then i'm running it what happens is the following so it, omp number is one run it at start of program hello world from thread zero um, i can also try and increase the number of threads so i can do that with changing the environment variable to eight in this case. And then I get uh, at start a program and hell world from different threads. <clears throat> so this was the program that, that did that, right? So let's look at what happened exactly. Um, we have, uh, so the way it works in OpenMP is that when your program is started, and I'm just starting those in the same way, it starts with a single thread, okay? That's, that's sort of the main thread that's, that is started. So in main starts, um, and since there's only one thread running, it, it prints at start of program here. And then as soon as it hits this pragma OMP parallel, something parallel happens. In fact, it launches, as, as I say, it launches the other threads. It launches eight threads. Each of those threads is gonna do what is in this block. So they, they all print out hello world from thread. And then I apparently may have a way to know what number they are and, and convert that to a string. <clears throat> um, 
Gabe asks if it makes a difference whether we are using hyperthreading or not. Um, and so it makes a difference in performance, but not in functionality. So if you had a, uh, say, a four core machine and you ran with OMP num 8 it would do it. It would work in the sense that it would run. But what really happens is that the number of cores is only four. There's eight threads of execution. So uh, each core basically takes turns between two threads of execution and does one part of one thread, then switches to the other thread and then switches back, um, which means that even in if that switching was free, which it is not, um, the maximum speed up you could get is a factor of four because you only have four cores. And in many cases, you want the number of threads to be equal to the number of cores. With hyper-threading, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> which is a situation where the, the chips are pretending to be uh, two cores when they're really one and a little bit, right? So one and a little bit of extra things. Um, it can help to, to use the number of threads that is equal to the number of hyper threads um, rather than the number of cores. So, but it's never a factor of two faster. So on Niagara, for instance, we have 40 cores. You can run with OMP num threads 40, that will give you one. Uh, one speed up, and then you can run with 80 on the same node, right? And um, it's never twice as fast. It, it's maybe you get like five percent speed up or something using that. Um, so that's so. So OpenMP doesn't say how many doesn't really work with cores. It works with threads, but the performance matter for the performance. It matters that you don't have way more threads than you have cores. Okay, so one funny thing you might notice here is that, okay, so this block is done in parallel by eight threads apparently, um, but they're all sort of in random order. Uh, thread zero, six, three, one, seven, four, five, two. What's up with that? Like, like, it seems like something is wrong with this code. Why is it printing in random order? In fact, if I run it again, the order will be different. Um, that is very strange, no? Um, so we'll, we'll get to why it's random and why that is actually not strange at all. Um, but just um, uh, while we're at it, we ran this job on the teach login node, or teach01 is it called, but it's a login node when you say ssh teach .sign at .ca, that's where you land. Um, <clears throat> if we are all starting to run our parallel codes, our, our own P codes on the, the teach, uh, cluster will very quickly run out of cores. So it can do it because it doesn't care how many threads it spawns or there's a very large limit somewhere. Um, but the number of cores is finite. And so very quickly we will, what was called, oversubscribe the cores and and you know, things will slow down. It also means that if you want to know how much faster your, 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 your code is on, say, eight cores versus one core, um, you can't do that on the login node, but you don't know if somebody else is running and already taking all of the cores. So now it might seem that your parallel code is slower than your serial code, uh, but it's just because other people were doing things and keeping the cores busy. So, you, uh, so for that reason, what you want to do is not run this stuff on the login nodes. There are 40 other nodes uh, in the teach cluster. All of them have 16 cores. They're, you can't just log into them. They're, not, uh, they're, they're uh, managed by the scheduler uh, and we call them compute nodes. So you can ask for dedicated resources on those compute nodes using the scheduler, using Slurm. Um, if you just want a short interactive test, you can actually use a special command called debug job and then mention how many cores you want for yourself. So that's, that's what you can do. Um, and then you get a prompt and you can do whatever. Um, that is still a shared... Um, a shared node. So other people that also ask for four cores will also uh, get onto that same node, but the cores are yours. So if you run, uh, say, eight threads with your four cores, then those four cores are getting overloaded and the other cores that are somebody else's are not used and they can do whatever they're supposed to do. Okay, so that's that. That's. For larger tests, you have to run a, a job script. Um, Marcel already showed something like this. So you can say how many nodes you want, how many CPUs per task. So CPUs per task is what Slurm calls threads. I do not know why it doesn't just say threads, but in any case, that's what it does. Um, I'm asking for an hour, I'm giving a job name, um, I'm telling it to email me if it fails and where the output goes. Um, 
Remember, I always have to load the modules back into the job script because this job script will be run on a different node, on a compute node. I haven't logged in there yet. I haven't loaded my modules there. So I start from scratch. So you have to say module load GCC. If you compile it with GCC, um, you have to say how many uh, threads you want. Oh, I forgot the export here. So this is actually not going to work. Uh, it's going to run serially, but I, I should say export OMP num threads equals, and then the same number as here. If I don't, and I don't use a full node, um, it might run uh, 16 threads anyway, although I asked for four. So this is, this is to make sure that the number of threads and the number of CPUs you asked for is in fact correct. And then you just run it. So when it runs, again, main starts with one thread, it hits the pragma OMP parallel, and now it spawns eight threads and they each do something. Now, um, that's the pragmas, and we'll talk about in, in depth on the different kinds of pragmas and how you can actually usefully do parallelism, because just printing out things in parallel is not that useful. Um, but it's not just pragmas, it's not just an extension of the language, uh, it's also a library. And so the, uh, the library fun has just a bunch of functions, and those functions are all in the header file omp.h. If you don't use any OpenMP functions, if you just, just use pragmas, you actually don't need to include this. Um, it doesn't really hurt, but you don't need to include this. Uh, but if you do, or if you want to use the function, you have to include the header file, and then you get such functions like uh, OMP get num threads, which gives you the number of threads that are currently running. So it can be useful to know how many threads you're using. Um, you can get the thread num of the current thread. So when things are running in parallel, they're all running a bit of code. They might want to know um, which thread am I? Am I thread zero? Am I thread one? And that was the one that we used when we were printing out our, our messages, and that's how they could know which thread they are. So that's that's int omp get num get thread num. Um, you can also set a number of threads. You rarely do this in code, but you can. And in, in maybe if you're doing experiments or tests, uh, this can be useful. If you're writing a test and you want to see if an algorithm works serially, and you want to see if it works with two threads, with four threads, you could program it in, and there's just an OMP set num threads function to set the number of threads. Okay. You can also ask for the number of processors. So that, that can be different from the number of threads, uh, depending on how, how you launch your job. This is physical. It's supposed to be the physical number of, of, of processors already. I think it's the number of processors that the operating system thinks there is. Um, and this is the actual number of threads that are running. So let's look at a new example with a little bit more uh, uh, use of these library functions. Um, so we're, we're including omp.h so that we have the library functions. We're using strings and, and streams. So um, same idea. At start of program, it prints out. Pragma omp parallel. Will, uh, will run the next block of code uh, in parallel. And it will use the number of threads that it will use here is whatever OMP num threads is set to. And if it's not set to, it will, it will run on all the cores of your machine. Okay. So pragma OMP parallel, uh, write out hello world from thread, uh, get your thread num. So this thread num is different from each of them. So it's kind of as if this code is, uh, I think an example with eight threads, like it's multiplied eight times and each, each copy is given to a different thread. It's kind of like that. Um, so it prints that. And then at the end, I want to know how many threads there were. Um, so I'm going to write out there were, and I'm using the OMP get num threads to see how many threads there were, uh, and I'm printing that out. So I'm going to make that. This example is called OMP num threads 2. I'm going to export. This time I did it right. Export OMP number threads is, 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 is 3. So I should get three outputs, uh, one, one at start, three hello worlds, and one there were. Um, and that's true. At start of program, hello world from thread zero, from thread one, from thread two. By sheer chance, these are uh, now in order. Um, and then it says there were one threads. But that is strange, because obviously there were three threads. Somebody have an idea why I get there were one threads. Like, I'll, I'll ensure, uh, I'll, I'll assure you that there is no bug in the in the OMP get num threads function. It returns what it should return, but it says it says one. Okay, so there's two questions and uh, a question and answer. First, I will do the question first. Uh, Prima OMP parallel runs uh, not necessarily one line, but the next block. 
So if I make, if I want to do more than one line, I have to put them between curly braces. So if I do a curly brace open and I can do as, as many lines as I want and another curly brace close, that whole block is now parallelized. So that's, that's a very quick uh, question. Um, yeah, the reason that it's giving me one is that I'm outside of the pragma, right? So this is not running in parallel and the function is supposed to give the number of threads that are running. But at this point, there is only one thread running. The other ones are already uh, are already closed, essentially. Okay, so that's how many there are outside of the parallel region. So there's a, a, an easier way to do uh, to solve it than what I'm going to show now, but I'm, I, I will show this anyway. So suppose we, we really wanted to measure inside of that parallel region how many threads there are. We haven't specified it in the code, so maybe we need it at some point. Maybe we need to uh, write that out. I don't know. Um, and so the way to do that, to, to get that out of the parallel region, is to ask for it within the parallel region, so when the threads are all active, and then store it in a variable and then print it outside of the region. Something like this. So um, I'm using two variables here, uh, t and n threads. Um, and forget the, for a moment all of the extra things I have here. I'm going to run this in parallel. Um, I'm going to store the current thread number in t. And if that thread number is 0, that, uh, that thread will ask, what are the number of threads that are running and store it in n threads? So, even without this default shared private stuff, um, what's going on here is that I only want one thread to try and, and compute how many threads are running. But because the other ones are running, it will get the right value. So it's not the number of threads in a thread that is always one. It's the number of threads in, say, the, the team of threads that has been launched. Um, why do I only want one thread to do it? Because I don't know exactly what will happen if I try to write to this poor and threads variable all at the same time from all of the threads. If I do that, I don't know, maybe something weird, weird will happen and we will see that this can happen. So I'm on purpose first asking, uh, so each thread is asking, what is my number? And I'll let only thread zero then um, collect the number of threads, put it in a variable. And then that, because it's in a variable, Afterwards, it still exists. So I can now print how many threads there are. So that's what this is supposed to do. But to make it work in this way, um, we have to say what, what happens to these variables when I enter a parallel region. In, if you thought of just pure shared memory programming, uh, then everything should be a shared variable, which means that as soon as I enter the pragma uh, on the parallel, I now have. Um, I think I ran three threads before, so I have now three threads running, um, but they all should see the same value of t and the same value of n threads because they're shared, right? Um, you would think so, but that would not work very well for this variable t because t is supposed to have a different value for each thread, right? So if this was a shared variable, so somewhere in shared memory and the threads ask or assign it a value, then um, they, they will certainly overwrite each other's values and, and only one of them will win. And there might be none of them that ever write, that, or T might never become really zero because that two was, uh, was sort of the winner that got to write to T last. Um, so that's, that's why in many cases, you need not just shared memory, you also need private memory, something that is specific to the thread. And so T is an example of that. It's a private variable. Um, and, and we do that by, by when, we, when we start our parallel region, uh, declaring it as private, so private T. What happens in some sense is that when it enters this parallel region, those, those four, those, uh, in this case, three threads were spawned, each of them gets a, uh, a new int T that it can use for whatever it wants. It's not even, its value is not even related to whatever this value had. Uh, in the in the original thread, those three threads had a private t that is an integer, and that's that they can do with whatever they want um, inside the parallel region. As soon as the threads stop existing, so it, it, as soon as you're outside of the parallel region, that value of t is gone. Like it was private to the thread, the thread doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Um, 
but that means that this, this private variable can be used to decide and to, to store a value that is threat specific. And if it's threat specific, uh, we can see if it's, if it's zero. And then if it's zero, I want it to store in n threads. Now, n threads cannot be a private variable because if it was a private variable, this storing of this value would be pointless. The thread stops to exist after the parallel region and with it, the variable stops to be to exist, and it isn't copied into this original n threads at all. There's no, uh, just because it's a private variable doesn't mean that it gets copied to a, a real variable if you want. Um, so rather than it being a private variable, this one I do want to be shared. I want it to be uh, that the same variable as it was outside of it, and all of the uh, all of the threads can write to n threads. I make sure only one of them does. So that, that makes this what is called thread safe, um, but it does write to a shared variable that still exists after, uh, after the parallel region. Okay. So for every variable, I will have to decide whether it's private or shared. And um, you don't have to be explicit about it. OpenMP has certain um, defaults for uh, variables that they are either shared or, par or private. But in this case, whatever those defaults are, because I, I make a point of it not to remember those defaults, whatever the defaults are, they would be the same for this T and for N threads. So whatever those defaults are, they must be wrong because I need one of them to be shared and the other private. And so a much cleaner way to write your, your OpenMP code is to say, I'm going to have no defaults for my variables, and I will specify for every variable I'm using in the parallel region, whether it's shared or whether it's private. And that prevents a lot of, uh, of bugs ahead of time. When you're writing the code, you can be fairly sure which of the two it should be. Okay. And so do say it then. Don't just uh, 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 rely on defaults and then. So, you know, six months later, look at your code and go, I'm not quite sure if this is shared or private or what it should be. You've, you've made it explicit, okay? So always, always default none, shared, whatever is shared, private, whatever is private. So this goes over the whole thing again, but now without the example. So a shared variable is what you think of as a shared memory variable. You can access it by all threads. It also means they can like, uh, right over one another, and that is an issue. We'll see about what that does. But it's very, very, very convenient for reading variables. You have to be a little bit careful for assigning things to variables because you can get what are called race conditions, where several threads are trying to write to the same variable uh, roughly at the same time, and then um, horrible things can happen, uh, unpredictable things. Um, the private variables, on the, hand, on the other hand, are used just in that thread. They are basically um, um, duplicated, so, so there's as many of them as there are threads, um, and they disappear after the thread. Um, it, if you don't designate it, the compiler chooses. Don't do, don't do that. Um, so one thing that that is just coming back to this race condition idea, um, when we had our, our print statements here, um, these are running in parallel, but not in lockstep. Okay. So just because they're running parallel means they're giving to different cores. That core might just have finished doing something else, like also writing to a screen. For instance, the, the, the first thread might be the same on the same core as, as, uh, as the zero. So maybe it has some catching up to do, some cleanup. We don't know exactly what it's doing. There are small differences in timing of, uh, between the, the instructions that are run. So they are running in parallel, um, but that means that it shouldn't matter in which order they run. And that's why, when you actually run them, they could run in any order. Um, thread zero gets, gets given to core zero, which wasn't quite ready to, to, to write to, to screen yet, but, but core one that got thread one was, and it wins, then we see thread one first. So they're running in parallel. They should be independent. It should not matter uh, in which order they run. That's the whole point. They're not running in order. They're running at the same time. Um, and uh, they should be able to run in, like in different orders if that has to be. And it, and it might have to be if you, if you are over, oversubscribing your, your kernels, your, your cores, right? So, so a race condition is for that reason, um, almost always unpredictable. Sometimes when, a, when two different uh, threads try to write to the same variable, in one case of, of running the same code, 
um, thread one wins, and in another case, thread two wins, and it, it basically looks like a random error. Um, you don't want those. You want to avoid those when you're when you're working with uh, shared memory programming. But that that is a typical uh, parallel bug that you can have uh, where uh, there's race condition. Uh, Baron asks if there is an automatic wait after the parallel job. Uh, yes, um, after the parallel uh, uh, start here and the parallel end here, at this end, all of the all of the threads do wait. Um, there are some constructs where you can say that it shouldn't wait, but the creation this is the creation of those threads. This last curly base is the the destruction or joining, as they call it of the threads. And that is a synchronization point that is uh, that they all wait until they're all done before this last thing. So you can be certain that the last sentence is is uh, printed after all of the uh, the individual threads have, have done their printing. OK, that you can be sure of. That's an order that is still maintained. Um, I think we mentioned this. This is what happened exactly. Oh, uh, one thing that is nice about uh, C and C++, and you don't really have that in Fortran, um, is that um, you can declare variables anywhere in the code. So we declare these variables at the top of in main uh, and threads and T, uh, but we really don't need T until we're inside this block. So you can actually move the, the declaration of this T variable, which is a, a, it's going to be a private variable, that private variable uh, in here. Um, now that does two funny things. Uh, first, um, private disappeared here and it has to disappear because when the compiler compiles this and it goes through this, um, no variable T exists yet. So I, 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 I would be specifying a uh, shared or privateness of a variable that doesn't exist. Uh, so the rule is that if a variable is declared inside a, uh, a parallel region, that variable is automatic private, automatically private. You can kind of think of this as a as an allocation of, of memory that holds an integer, and each of the threads does its own allocation. That's not quite how it happens, but uh, conceptually, that's why when you declare a variable inside a parallel region, they are automatically private. That, and that also means that you don't really have to anymore think about whether they are private or not. I, I'm declaring them here. They only exist in this scope, but they also only exist while this, while each of the threads is, is running. So that's kind of uh, an, an easier way to do things. I can't do this with in threads because if I declare it inside, first of all, it would be private and it wouldn't exist after the security brace. And so I can't, I can't print it after. Okay, so that was a lot of trouble to go through something that only one thread should should do. Yes, yeah, so uh, Rob asked, is that the preferred way to do it? Yes, declare variables that are private inside the region um, is, 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 is a good way to go. It's even a good way to go in serial code uh, because you can't accidentally have name clashes um, of variables. Okay, so uh, we didn't care which of the threads set and thread right in that code really we didn't we picked zero but that's because zero always exists um, even in a serial code there is a thread zero because it starts number get zero um, really what we care about is that it, it gets set by a thread and then we might as well have it done by the the first thread that sort of gets it so as i said threads aren't exactly in lockstep one is one is slightly ahead of another i think by microseconds or something uh, or less but that means that we can we can just say, well, we want this, this n threads thing set by just wh whoever gets there first, whichever thread gets there first. There is a pragma for that. It's called pragma OMP single. And so this whole code can actually be replaced by something a little bit simpler, where we do a pragma OMP parallel. We have that default none, shared n threads. And now we rather than trying to determine uh, the thread number and uh, etc., we say pragma OMP single on the next line. So that means. This line is done by whatever thread gets there first. So whatever thread gets there first is, is still in a parallel region. So this, so, uh, this is the co first code block that I'm seeing. So pragma-omp-single doesn't count as a code block. It, it's not a directive. 
So both of these act on this one line here. Uh, one thread, whoever gets there first, out of the three threads that were launched, will get to set n threads, and the rest will basically be doing nothing. Uh, so it's not very effective, efficient, but that's what's happening. And, and then I can see how many threads there are. There are other cases where you might want to do single. This seems like a silly way, but imagine that you have a parallel code. Uh, it's running in parallel. All the threads are doing things, but every now and then you want to print out where it is. Maybe this is an, an iterative process and you want to print out, I'm in iteration 100, uh, 101, 102. If there is 16 threads all writing, I'm in iteration 100, that is kind of uh, polluting your screen. And so that, so sim sim simple output, or, Maybe an OMP single or something could happen. Does that make sense? Any questions? So we saw how we get uh, into a parallel region where the threads are created and then, then destroyed at the end. And we saw variables that can be shared or private. So we're going to look at loops next if there's no questions. So um, loops are a very common thing happening in scientific code. Um, usually we have either data or a grid or, or what have you with many numbers and we want to do a similar thing on each of the numbers. Uh, and it, it, it seems like that should be a good candidate to parallelize uh, your code, to run them and using several cores at the same time. Um, so we're going to now add a, add a loop, a very simple loop in the same parallel region um, I'm going to add a loop from, from 0 to 15, and I'm going to print out the thread number and the i number. Um, so if I run this on two threads, just, let's go back to compile this. Um, same idea, but get, get the thread number and just do a loop inside of this parallel region. Uh, what happens is each of the loop, each of the threads does its own loop, right? So thread 0 has i equals 0, but thread 1 has an i equals 0 as well, because they just run their own loop. Um, another way to think of that is that is this i here um, is private. So they're each running over the same thing. If I made it shared, uh, all hell would break loose because I'm asking for updates of the i number. Um, and so each thread is updating i at the same time and that's a race condition. So it has to be private, um, but um, it, they're all doing 16 cases. So suppose that's not what I want. Suppose what I really want is yes, I have a loop, there are 16 cases to do, and I want to distribute those cases over the threads. So if I had four threads, I would probably want uh, four of them to go up to one thread, next four to another thread, et cetera, right? And then they could be run in, 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 in parallel and would, would potentially be four times faster than doing these things um, one after the other with a single core. So this is not quite what we want to do uh, in, in most cases. Um, what we want to do is what's called work sharing. So we have a, a for loop. It has some work to do. And there's a bunch of iterations there. Um, if they can be done independently, they can be done in parallel, right? If each thing that is done in, in whatever the body of the loop is, is independent of the, in, I say it's a for loop i equals zero, et cetera. If it, it is independent of the, the iteration index, then they could be done simultaneously because it doesn't matter who gets done first or, or when. Okay, so OMP, uh, uh, OpenMP has a, uh, a construct for that. It's called OMP4. Um, so we're in our parallel region here. We are asking for our thread number. And then we have our same for loop, but in this case, we prepend it with pragma OMP4. And this does a lot of magic for us. It, it will make the compiler look at this loop so there are six, 16 iterations here. I have however many uh, cores, and I'm going to divide the i values such that um, uh, a proportional fraction of each of this set of i values goes to each core. Um, so for instance, if I do this with two threads and I run it, uh, thread zero got i equals zero, i equals one, i equals two, three, four, five, six, and seven. But the second thread, because I'm running it with two threads, so the second thread is numbered one, right? Gets eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So now we've done work sharing. We've given different cases to different threads 
uh, such that each thread is done. And as you can see, it's random in which order it's printed. So you can't count on any ordering um, and you shouldn't want to, that, that, and that should be the case. If there is a reason to order this, then that's a reason why this cannot be parallelized. Right? Parallel means things are independently done. So they better have to be okay if they're done in a different order. Okay, let's look at a slightly less trivial example. So let's let's um, uh, break our rule that we will never write our own linear algebra routines and uh, write one for the Dexby routine. So that is a x a times x plus y, uh, where x and y are uh, vectors, and a is a uh, a floating point, and the d stands for double precision. Um, so here's a bit of code that does that. And, and the point is that we're gonna look at how we would parallelize such an operation. So we're having two vectors, element by element, we want to multiply and add them. Um, and that should be, should be parallelizable. So I've got just, this is the driver code, creates an X array, an RA, X, Y, Z. Um, it fills them with this init routine. So X and Y get some values. Uh, doesn't even matter what they are. And then it, it's calling this dex p routine. So here's a, here's x, here's y. The results should go into z. So x and y are cons because they don't change, and z is the result. And just to see how this looks, uh, the init routine hardly matters, but it just sets values such as x i is i squared and x and y i is i plus one squared. Um, there's there's just no reason for this except that it has to have some values, so not everything is zero. And then here's the deck speed. So the deck speed uh, gets two arrays, X and Y, uh, or H and a third one, Z. Um, so I wanna know how many elements are in there, that's N, uh, just to make sure I don't go over anything and it is possible to pass in arrays of different lengths. I basically take the minimum of all of their sizes so that, that the next loop is safe uh, uh, and we'll just compute for all of the X, Y, and Z's that exist, um, X times A plus Y and adds it to Z. That's what the deck speed is supposed to. Okay, so here's a for loop. Uh, uh, there's a for loop in, the, in it as well, and there's a little driver. Um, suppose that this is too slow for us um, in serial mode, and we want to parallelize that. Um, how would we do it? Um, so, when you're parallelizing loops, you first have to see if they are independent. In other words, where is the concurrency? What can be done at the same time? Um, then you have to divide the work over the threads. So, OpenMPs can help you with that. Um, but you have to know. Uh, what variables the threads have to, have to know about, right? You have to know what's private, what is shared. Uh, we're gonna do a uh, default none. So you have to say for every variable that you use, whether they're shared or private. Um, so that's, that's what we have to do. So this is my solution here. I actually um, uh, open and repeat both the in, in it and the my dex piece. Um, so I, I start by uh, noting that int n is basically the same um, everywhere, right? So I, I don't have to compute that in a parallel region, but the for loop has to go in a parallel region. So I'm creating a parallel region here. You'll have as many uh, threads as I say with OMB num threads or as there are in the system, um, default none. And then some things have to be shared. And so I'm looking at the loop and I'm going, okay, um, it needs its own I value, but that's taken care of because I have int I. Um, so that's private by, by default, but I have to be able to access X and Y. So those better be shared. And then N is, is computed here. Um, and so that I have to share that too. Otherwise the inside doesn't know what it is. Um, I am, uh, so, so that's a parallel region. Then the OMP4 will take these N values of I and uh, say there are four, uh, four threads and, and 16 N values, um, it will, give the first four I values to threads zero to do, the next four I values to thread one, et cetera. Um, that way they also don't um, step onto one another because all the I values are different. So even though I'm accessing the same array from different threads, which potentially is a race condition, because I'm do doing different elements of each array, it's safe. So that's happening here. And essentially the same thing is happening here, except I also have a Z to be shared so that when the result uh, comes out, it's, it's still in that array. Okay. 
Note that there is a private variable here, right? I is private. So int I is, is, is declared inside of the parallel region is automatically private, but it's assigned different values for each thread automatically by this OMG4 directive. Does it work? Oh, uh, well, you have to trust me that it works. I thought I had to run here, but that's it. Does it make sense? Note that you promise to the compiler that these are independent and can be done in parallel. If there's a dependency, say this depends on uh, uh, zi minus one or something, then you saying that they're independent will mean that they're computed in random order and you will get a random result. And so that's it, it's your promise to the compiler saying this is independent. This is also why we have to do this. Compilers aren't really smart enough to realize what is and what is it not the in, interdependent. Um, they can to a little extent, but to a large extent they cannot. So we have to tell them what can be parallelized. And then OpenMP compilers can do that for you. Um, it can do a couple of other things for you. Um, if you have constants, um, they are automatically shared. So um, that, that can be nice. We can actually replace the int n here with a const int n. And then we don't even have to say that they're shared because their constants are automatically shared. Um, you, yes, you must share std out. If you're doing std out, it, std c out is a variable. If you don't make it shared, you cannot use it inside of your parallel regions. Um, Pragma OMP parallel for OMP4. Um, yeah. So you notice our early examples didn't have that because I didn't say default none. Um, so they're actually bad examples, but you got to start somewhere. Um, another nice convenience is that you often have a Pragma OMP parallel and then a loop follows right away. And you can just say Pragma OMP parallel four. So we could say instead of this, we can say this Pragma OMP parallel four, default none shared xy. And uh, const int n make, means that n is automatically shared. I'm actually not even allowed to say it here anymore because it is what it is. It's a constant. Um, and so that, that's what happens here. Another nice thing to see about this code now, once, we, once you have these tricks under your belt, is that you essentially take, see the serial code here. It's just n is, is, a, is a value. I have a for loop. This is what my serial code would look like. And I have a single line that parallelizes this. This is a bit deceptive because you have to know what this line does, that it starts the threads, that it uh, work shares the I values, that it, uh, it automatically shares the, the consts that are there. Um, you have to know all these things to make sure that this happens properly, but the, the difference in the code itself is fairly small. Ah, here's, here's. What happens when I, so I ran it and I'm actually uh, measuring the uh, the time at a, a TikTok in there somewhere here, TikTok. Um, I think Marcelo showed you that one as well. So I'm measuring the time and it goes down if I use more threads. Yay, it's five times faster. Or almost six times faster. That should disappoint you slightly if this is the first time you see parallel programming. Um, because really, Didn't we throw 16 threads at the pro problem? Shouldn't it not be 16 times faster, or at least very close to 16 times? Um, well, yes. Yeah. So let's try it again on, uh, on a, with a debug job to make sure that it wasn't because somebody else was doing something else. So the first thing to do is get reliable uh, timings, and you go to teacher one. Uh, you say debug node dash n8 if you want to run with eight, and and you uh, you resource your your modules. And, and maybe recompile the recompilation should not be necessary and then run it. Uh, the trouble is you'll actually give get in this case pretty much the same result. It's still only 5.5 times faster. And so uh, we'll see in the next lecture why there's a limit to how fast we're going. And um, so I don't want to uh, spoil the surprise, uh, but it is a typical case in parallel programming, that it's never perfect. Marcelo already mentioned this. Um, if it's not a trivially parallel program, you're not going to get perfect scaling. It's not so clear why this is not trivially parallel, though. So that's what we'll have to clear up next time.
so there's yeah it's more than serial overhead uh, there is some overhead in in just writing out and doing the TikTok. Uh, that's true but that's kind of why the code here has its own TikTok. so the tick just started just before all of the parallel stuff in the talk after so um there's there's not a lot of serial stuff left here there's a little bit but um so it has it yeah so we'll we'll see next time exactly why uh what else uh, apart from serial um overhead and communication which we don't have here or at least doesn't look like it uh, why there's still a limit Any other questions? So I, I have to say that I find OpenMP one of the um, nicest way to start parallel programming. You need to know all the concepts of fat starting and shared memory and private and stuff. But the amount of coding you have to do and that you should have to do uh, can be fairly small. You can go very elaborate. Uh, it is very tempting to, uh, to do that at first. Um, you might think that if I want to run on eight cores, I have to define everything eight times, or maybe have to have arrays with eight numbers. Uh, uh, no, uh, you have to try and, and make the code as close to the shared, uh, to the serial case as possible, and then um, try and, 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 and have all of the threat creation and stuff be dealt with with OpenMP. There's no mention here of how many uh, threads I'm using, that is externally determined. So it will run on any thread. If I port this to another machine that has 2,000 cores, say, and in fact, those, those are there, but suppose, then it would still run. Would it run well? I don't know, but it would run. That's a good question. Are, can recursive calculations be paralyzed? And, and the answer is no, not, not just like that. Um, you'd have to come up with a different algorithm to compute the same thing. And that's something I think Marcelo mentioned too. Sometimes the fastest parallel algorithm is very different from the fastest serial algorithm. So the serial algorithm is stuck. Ah, the traffic model. Uh, you'd have to do some work to, uh, to make sure. So one thing you cannot do in the traffic model is to parallelize the different time steps. So the time direction cannot be parallelized. But there's a side dependence in the, uh, in the spatial dimension as well, because we have to compute distances, right? Before we know if we can take a step or where the velocity can be. So we better not overwrite our, our values before we've determined those. So that is a matter of, of sort of um, unraveling or, or, or making the dependencies less. So there can be slight differences there. For the traffic model, it's not so bad, it's doable, uh, but definitely the time direction cannot be done, uh, cannot be paralyzed. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> 